Are we live? We're it's live. Ten, 10 years. That's what that is. 10 years, everybody. Yeah. How we doing? Hi, everyone. Hello. Hi, hi, hi. You guys, I'm sorry. Uh, there's an outage on my local okay? internet, so it's possible I may drop. I'm using uh, my phone as a hotspot. I'm using cell data. If I drop, please be patient. I'll, I'll try to reconnect. The company's trying to get it sorted right now. Hello. Hi, 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 everybody. Can you, can you okay. hear me, We have me? one hour, so I can hear you. Okay. I can hear you fine. So we're all good. Great. Okay, we'll, we'll just jump right into it. Hi, everybody. If you don't know who the person next to me or below me, depends on, you know, where you look at, is. <laughs> it depends on if you're upside down. <laughs> well, it depends. Well, it's the person that, you know, of whom, like, he, well, he's the guilty party that we're here today, basically. That's <laughs> what I'm going to say, right? Ten years later, <laughs> since he had a great idea, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now we're all here. Um, but talking about his artist career, he's a fine artist, an educator, uh, specializing in drawing uh, the human figure and sculpting. Uh, he's very active in social media, so if you guys haven't come across him, Ugh. he's very active in our Discord community, very active. And uh, he is very um, also active in his Instagram, his TikTok, and he has a Facebook page Thanks. and a YouTube, which he always updates regularly. Yeah, except so, for I just quit TikTok. Um, as yeah, but that's pretty yeah. Did you? Really? Yeah, it's, oh, no. it's, too, it's too, I did not know that. It's too stupid. I can't. It's too stupid. But uh, the other, the others I update. Yeah. So, oh well. You. Others are updated. So no TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> Find me on but Threads. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everybody. Who cares about TikTok, anyways? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you Hi, for everyone. the introduction, Alex. Uh, before we, s <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. It was a bit whimsical. <laughs> um, but. We're, we're gonna start the Q&A now. Uh, before we start there, you guys can see the sign our guest book if you want. I don't know in which corner you can see it. I believe it's this one. Um, you're more than welcome. If you sign sign it, put in your, you know, what do you think about New Masters Academy, you will be put into a raffle later Ooh. on. So everybody, if you want to have an additional raffle, <laughs> sign, sign the guest book. Thank you. Those raffles are lit. <laughs> okay, but yeah, let's, yeah, I mean, the prizes are awesome. Like, who yeah. doesn't want to have a cool mug with yeah. a cool quote? Hell yeah. And hoodies. And, yeah. you know, there's a lot of stuff. Yeah. 10 years, 10 years. So talking about 10 years, let's go a bit back and just start talking how the idea came to be. Why did you decide to do, like, New Masters Academy, you know? Let's just start with that. Yeah, so I was, uh, in 2010, I started... I think around there in 2010, I started studying art myself. So I changed my majors at the university and I decided I wanted to, I wanted to be a, an artist. I, I, it was a change for me. I think I was 20, anywhere between like 21 and 23. I don't actually remember exactly. But when I, when I switched majors at my university to art, it's because I wanted to try it. I just found that the program was really, was, was, it had issues, you know. I thought that they would be teaching you how to draw, and they'd be teaching you how to paint and do all the, you know, teaching you art, uh, which was a mistake from my part. In reality, it was mostly teaching you on how to like critically defend your work, talk about art, present yourself. It was much more like of a modern sort of take on it. And so I tried transferring to another university uh, in California, maybe one that had a better art program. And so as I was researching that, I found that all the universities were basically the same, besides like these specialty schools, you know, these specialty art schools. And so I, I spent actually, when I first started studying art, I ended up leaving the university and um, studying on my own. And I was, I went, you know, I was traveling around the world. I went to Florence and I looked at the academies there. I was, you know, I was in New York looking at the schools. I was trying to find like an educational home. And in the meantime, I was self-studying. So for me, that was traveling to museums. That was, uh, I wanted to draw like the old masters. I wanted to sculpt marble, which was my, that was like an idea I had ever since I was 14. And I, uh, my mother took me and a group of her students. She was a teacher. We went to uh, Europe. Uh, and on that first trip, we had gone to Athens. We had gone to Paris. We went to Rome. And so I got to 
go inside the Louvre and you know the see the Sistine Chapel and 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 all and uh, you know these Greek masterpieces and that made such an impression on me that that's what that that was my goal. I wanted to carve you know masterpieces at the on the level of the old masters, but I couldn't find a program that seemed to offer any any track towards that at all. And so um, what I ended up doing, which a lot of people you know do, is I started just trying to find individual teachers. Like who are the, who's the best, who's the best, I would go online and stuff too, and it's like who's the best at draftsmanship? Like who's the best at drawing? And the names that, there were some names that kept coming up, one of them was Glenn Vilpu, and that was something that people in the animation industry at that time, because he wasn't really known that much outside of animation at that time, but people, uh, the animators who were really strong drafts people were saying, Glenn's the best, Glenn's who taught the animators how to draw, he's in Drawn to Life, with Walt Stanchfield's book, he, him and you know Carl Ganas and Steve Houston and their teacher and their teacher's teacher Harry Carmine and that's sort of like the fun and who was studied with Bridgman. So there there were like drawing specialists who were teaching illustrators and animators how to draw, who were incredibly skilled, and so that's sort of my first uh, real artistic training in a way. Um, I also studied with Michael Mentler as well but was was Glenn. And so uh, Glenn Vilpu and I developed a relationship. I basically became an apprentice or mentee, whatever you want to call it. Uh, that was something that I thought existed and didn't really know that that was sort of dead. But we built a relationship and, and I would study privately with Glenn at his home and I would help him with his company as it was sort of a trade. So I would help him give him advice on his company because I had experience in that area. And I suggested Vilpu Academy to Glenn um, and I helped him get that off the ground. So that's an award-winning online school called Vilpu Academy. You should check it out. It's still really popular. It, it, when it, it's gotten lots of recognition over the years. And uh, so after doing Vilpu Academy with Glenn, that sort of gave me the idea to sort of expand on that. Because Vilpu Academy is very much like Glenn's perspective. But what I was hoping for to, to create was that art school that I couldn't find for myself. And so that was, there was an initial group that included Glenn Vilpu. It included uh, other artists, other amazing artists as well. Bill Perkins, who was a Disney veteran and thought leader in the entertainment area and also an amazing uh, landscape painter. Uh, you know, Bill had done Aladdin. He was the uh, art director. He'd done Little Mermaid. He'd done all these big, all these big projects. And, Glenn, and Bill was really good at organizing entire uh, uh, teams to work on a show and had developed, you know, really, really sort of developed vid the, the visual development storytelling, you know, as a craft. And so some of these people who were probably more than half on the entertainment side, but all just amazing artists, that was sort of the initial team that, that we got together. And Glenn had introduced me to people and then other people had introduced me to others. But people liked who was involved, you know what I mean? When they found out that it was, you know, Steve Houston and Bill Perkins and Glenn Vilpu and these other artists, Juliet Aristides, you know, Ed Froughton, who is a, uh, was a big influence on me. Ed Froughton is a monument sculptor. He's like friends with presidents of the United States. He did, he worked on some of the biggest, uh, most ambitious uh, public works in, in the country's history. He's one of the most successful sculptors in the history of the country. So uh, that was really interesting because you had like monument figure people, you had entertainment people, you had drawing specialists. So the initial team was sort of a, uh, we had this vision for what education should be and how education was falling short. And it was sort of a team effort to put this together, but not only put it together, but do it at an affordable rate. So New Masters was, I think, $20 a month when it first, when it first launched. And, uh, 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 and there was even a cheaper rates for the beta. So the idea was to do better content than what was available in the art schools, but also to make it cheaper than anything else. And there were no other, we were the first subscription learning site for, for, for art. Uh, we were also the first to do 3D models. So our 3D model viewer is older than Sketchfab. So before Sketchfab, we were doing it. We were the first to make these anatomical models and teach them with using 3D. And since then, many other, I mean, many people have followed suit in a lot of the things we've done, but we, it was an industry changing uh, project. And you can read about it in John Warillo's uh, book by Penguin called uh, The Automatic Customer. They do a bunch of pages on New Masters right at the beginning. He had written that in like 2012, I think, something like that. But it was, uh, there was no subscription model for art education. Art education, and a lot of the, back then when I was talking to other uh, artists to get them involved, there were doubts whether art could even be taught online. 
which is hilarious now because it's mostly taught online. At that time, there was pushback. And so it was so, sort of like something we had to convince people was a good idea. And we used the famous artist course by uh, uh, Norman Rockwell and a lot of those illustrators. They had done something called, it was a correspondence course called the famous artist course. That was sort of the, because you know when you pitch something, you need like a tagline. It's like Netflix meets famous artist course or whatever. That was sort of the, the idea was that it wasn't just taught by teachers, it was taught by leading thought, thought leaders and the top uh, skilled professionals that leaders worldwide and it's only that. That was the idea, but it's also affordable and people can do it from home, excuse me. I'm gonna sneeze. <laughs> but that's how, that's how we got started. And I, I did not, it, this was like the 11th company I had done and I did, and it was not my, I, I did not think it was gonna be my primary focus when we started it, but it was definitely like the right time and the right idea and it just ended up taking up more and more of my life. So when New Master started, I was involved in like three or four projects. I was on the board of directors on two uh, nonprofits. I was actively involved in other other businesses and then I had New Masters and that was like kind of like, it was a smaller project at first. And then over time it just like, like, like spore, it would just eat all the other organisms until it became, you know, like my whole life alongside my art. And today, for the most part, you know, it's the marble carving and my artwork, it's new masters, and then everything sort of, I mean, obviously my marriage, but everything else uh, falls under that. And so it is also interesting, like, I've done lots of projects and you never know which ones are gonna, you know, and this one is definitely like one that, that really that really hit and has just continued to continue to grow. And so, yeah, uh, sorry that's too much. Oh, no, it's always uh, <laughs> awesome to hear yeah. like beginnings of, uh, you know, such a successful company. It was say. it was definitely like um, it was definitely a mission because I know that there there, are, there were other companies like there was Nomon was around at the time, uh, which who I, I loved Nomon's DVDs, you know. Uh, Nomon was around, so there were other companies out there, but New Masters was, it was different in that it focused on foundations, the instructors were only the top thought leaders, and it was really affordable, it was really uh, cheap, essentially, the, and, and that it was focused on a mission, so it was focused on building an actual curriculum, creating better artists, it wasn't just, oh, this comic artist is famous, here's an hour and a half of them drawing, like, that's, that's, what, that's what tutorials were back then. It was there was it wasn't like a, it wasn't like art school. So the idea with us too is that it would be art school but affordable and online. That was sort of a, a big difference as well as the the business side and all that. Hello. <laughs> I'm just seeing you chat. Oh, we we have the chat back on. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. That was super interesting. Um, Thank you. And obviously, like ten years, a huge milestone. Yeah. Like. You know, from like a small idea to like such a big community Crazy. now, like with the digital campus going on with Discord. Yeah, yeah. A lot of artists have actually now, you know, a, a spot to gather and actually talk ideas, which yeah. I, I myself believe we were lacking that in the art community. I think like so especially too. online. Like yeah. yeah, you had forums, you know, you did have forums, but Forms usually die off pretty fast. Yeah, there was, I mean, I used to be, there in was Wet Canvas now. at conceptart.org and Wet Canvas when I was starting out. Those were kind of the places where people talked. But I actually agree that there wasn't a great place because there were communities that were centered around online teaching things, but they're mostly like, the culture was mostly of selling. It was a selling culture. It's like, did you buy the brush pack? Did you buy the thing? Did you buy that? And I feel like in order for it to become a healthy community, people need to feel like it's actually about the students and it's for them. And uh, I do have to give credit though, I can't, I can't, uh, the original idea to do the Discord came from a community member named Eden, who is, uh, I'm sure most of you people, if you're in the community, you know that. So if you like the Discord community, please thank Eden, that was her idea. I did not know that. <laughs> I have to say thank you to her. I hate to admit um, it. I that, that's a surprise to me. She never told me that. She also, it was also the Drawbox partnership so yeah, was also her idea. Eden. The Drawbox partnership was her idea too. So, yeah. Okay, everybody just go, go to Eden right now and tell her <laughs> thank you. Yeah. We have a great community because of Eden's idea. So. <laughs> she should just come up here. I'll just no, but, get off. Um, yeah. <laughs> so Eden, when did you get the idea? <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah. No, uh, but let's, uh, yeah. 
we we talked about how it started you mentioned like there was no subscription services obviously no. yeah it had to be really hard to actually gain people's trust to you know subscribe to something yes. new like that yeah that's that's the hard thing about that. i mean the book talks about it uh automatic customer talks about it but the hard part is getting over the hump of having enough content where somebody would think it's because look you had netflix and stuff and they would just give you like an unbelievable amount of content right well and they're doing that mostly through licensing deals and stuff so we didn't have the kind of money to license a bunch of content you know uh, there was the initial investment was uh probably around half a million dollars that all came from me. There was no investors besides my, me. And there was no way we could license it, but also the content that existed on video, none of it was structured the way New Masters was going to be. So there was DVDs or you know, plein air painting demos or what, all kinds of stuff, but none of it would have fit together in a structural way. So licensing content, although you know we, we tried uh, licensing deals, like I tried to license Richard Williams's stuff at one point, there were other things. But at the end of the day, we ended up just having to create everything. So the hard part is not only getting people to subscribe, yeah, but also getting the teachers to invest their time. Because there was like 10 months or more where we were just recording stuff and they weren't seeing any, because it was a revenue share deal, they weren't seeing any, uh, any return on that for a long time. So you had to get the, so if you want the best instructors, but then they have to believe in the project, they have to be willing to, to put all this work into a course and then hope it actually happens because maybe the website never goes live or whatever. So the it was a huge leap of faith for all the original instructors that were involved and it was a really difficult thing to pull off. But um, I do think subscription, I know subscription models are actually unpopular sometimes now, but the whole point, of, what I like about a subscription model is you can pay a small amount and get the world as long as you're willing to put the time in to actually use the material. And that, in that respect, it's a really good business model. So like a gym membership is a, not a good idea if you aren't going to the gym, but if you're there every day, every day, and it's a part of your life, and you're, you know, it, it's just a part of your everyday routine, then, and you're playing basketball, and you're in the pool, and you're doing cardio there, and you're lifting, and you're, all of that for whatever it is, $30, $40, so I like the idea because my thinking was that the students who really want to become a professional, they'll buy old books, they'll learn from obscure sources, they'll do whatever it takes to like get that information. And so New Masters was, is there for them to take full advantage of. And the fact that most of the industry was moving more into like a pay as you pay for individual content, I didn't like that model. And the reason I don't like that model is you're always selling something. You're always selling something. There's a new brush pack, there's a new thing, there's a new thing. And in order to sell it, you start making decisions on how, you're, you're choosing the products based on the sales side, which is a, not good for education. Because if you're just doing the stuff that people is appealing to the beginner, you're pandering to them. And you're not, so, so the stuff they really need to know is not gonna be as sexy as the techniques and the you know, the, the, the cool stuff they want to do. So there's a mixed incentive. You end up, in order to be more successful in the business, you end up pandering to what the beginner wants instead of thinking of what they actually need. And so that's what I liked about a subscription is that once you're in the new masters, once you're a, a member of the community and you're, uh, you have a subscription, we're taking care of you. And that's a, that's a trust and an authority thing. And that's, that's more what I wanted instead of just constantly having to hawk shit all the time. Uh, that was that was definitely not like the way I wanted it to go, you know. It's like, oh, this yeah, person's got a, a this person's got two hundred thousand people on Instagram. Now let's watch a demo. Well, you can watch those demos, and you're never gonna you're never gonna achieve mastery. It's not enough. You actually yeah. need like structure and interaction and all this stuff over over years in order to get there. So that's I know sometimes people will compare us to Schoolism or you know Skillshare or Domestica or all these other sites, but for the most part, those sites are they're courseware sites. They sell content. That's what they do. New Masters is a, an online art school, but we we use the format of a subscription model. And so, like I know whenever I see lists and stuff of oh top online things, I don't even think we're in the same category because what we do here is really different. But I like the business model of a subscription because of that, your, your ability to take full advantage. Because imagine if you had to buy all the courses on New Masters, it would, it would be freaking insane because there's 3,000, we have more content than any of the, the other sites that are, you know, uh, that, like the ones I'm talking about, we have way more. So it would actually be a fortune in order to, to get all the way through, you know, four years of art school, it would cost thousands of dollars. So this, I mean, 
much more. So I think this is also this is I think this is the most affordable way that somebody can get an art education online. Yeah, and obviously a lot of students from other countries are very grateful for that. Uh, as like me, me too. Like I come from a small country. We don't really have any good art schools. There's one, but like you know, they can only accept so many students. Yeah. So, yeah, I believe like New Masters really made art and like learning from like really good artists like yeah. craftsmen like affordable to like other countries outside of the you know united states that's it yeah and, yeah. Like, and we actually bigger countries we, that actually have good schools we do have special pricing for some countries too and we started that with india so if you're watching this and you're in india you qualify for uh, a different price and so w w that's one thing i'd like to do we can talk about this later but one of the things in the next 10 years is i want to have prices for because I know if you live in Brazil, if you live in some countries where even the rate it is now, which is way, way, way less than art school, it still would be, uh, we still want to build on that too. We want people to actually use it. We want people to uh, benefit from it. And then we want them to change the world with their art. You know, that, that's, that's really the goal. So um, the, the, the goal has always been how do we give more without charging more, you know? And, and that's been like, you know, the library went from 150 hours of video to thousands of hours of video. So that that's, that's more than 10 X. It's like 20 X or whatever it is. But at the same time, the price relative to that over the years has moved very little. The image library went from having like maybe a few hundred images to having, I don't know, 160,000 images. All the, 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 the value has just kept growing and the price relatively has, has stayed low because that, that's, that's really the point. We want people to be able to, afford it and if they can do this like the idea is if you do new masters academy you don't actually have to do any other website you don't need anything else but this that, that that's really the goal so if you're trying to budget for your art education or you're maybe you're young and you're talking with your parents and you're trying to figure this out it seems like the rate you pay at new masters there's no way you're going to get there's no way it's equivalent to art school but it actually is and we're working i'll talk about it later but we're working on getting accreditation and as part of that process we're at the first step where we're well, we're at the first stage. There's several stages of accreditation, but the stage we're at right now, oops, <laughs> the first stage, the stage we're at right now is actually we're overqualified. So New Masters Academy is vastly overqualified for accreditation. That's unusual when you're applying for this. Usually they have to get up to the standard. So um, that's something that we believe in too, is we just want to keep increasing the value as much as, as much as we can. And now I think the community is one of the biggest parts of the value, and that didn't even exist three years ago, the Discord community. So I think one of the most valuable things about New Masters now is the New Masters community, and that's actually, uh, it's basically new. And uh, yeah, it's really exciting to see how that's, that, see how that's evolved. Yeah, it's a great place uh, to like really connect with people. Yeah. Okay, let's- uh, Let's do some let's questions. Let's jump into some questions. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's what, what we're here for. Sure. Okay, let's just start with, uh, you've been sculpting a lot lately. I've seen yeah. the videos, I've seen yeah. the posts. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. So we actually have a question about sculpting. Like how has sculpture changed the way you approach drawing and painting? Uh, it's, um, I was sculpting, I was sculpting before I was studying drawing seriously so i drew as a, as a kid like everybody else you know growing up I, I you know not everybody else but i would draw as a child i was always i had an aptitude for it um but i never had any drawing classes my mom would teach me to draw a little bit because she could draw and so i had the drawing ability but i wasn't drawing all through high school like i would do like a caricature of my teachers and everybody would love it so i would i would draw if it was like entertaining for people uh but for the most part i wasn't really drawing that much you know, as a teenager or whatever, but but I had decided I wanted to sculpt before and before I decided to uh, focus on drawing, and so I decided to learn how to how to how to draw so that I would be able to do the sculptures because I didn't think it was possible to sculpt like Michelangelo or Bernini or Giambologna or let alone the the Hellenistic masters that I was uh, inspired by. I didn't think that was possible without good drawing, and, and I feel like that even more. So for me, it was just like the it was just like our track system, right? You got to do drawing foundations first, and then you can move on to, you know, going into painting or figure or illustration or comics or, in my case, uh, modeling and sculpture. So, but at first, I was actually modeling in in wax and in clay, 
before I was seriously studying the drawing. And then once I sort of realized that it's all drawing and drawing is the key, and that's what Vasari says, drawing's the mother of the other arts, and that's what all of the masters of sculpture throughout history were expert at drawing, I realized that I needed to like spend time to learn that properly. And that's how I got onto sort of the self-study thing with the Michelangelo's and then seeking out Glenn and, and Michael Mentler and these other, and these other uh, instructors and stuff. So uh, yeah, the sculpture came first, the drawing came to support that. So it's hard for me to say, what did sculpture do for my drawing? Because I've always had the sculpture. Um, and even as a kid, I would draw you know, from figures. I would make 3D things and draw from that. But I do think that sculpture, I think sculpture is, is galaxy brain for drawing. I think that um, thinking spatially, for representational, thinking spatially is really important. And I think people today, I think that's sort of a one argument. People know that. So if you're doing representational illusionary drawing, 3D thinking is key. But I think that where I differ from a lot of other uh, artists or teachers is that I don't think perspective or drawing boxes, drawing forms, plotting perspective, I don't think that is synonymous with 3D thinking. So that's one thing that I have a difference with because you can think of, because for example, Michelangelo did not use perspective and some of his paintings and stuff are some of the greatest of all time. So perspective is clearly not required to make a masterpiece because you can point to many traditions across the world that are not using perspective that are clearly masterful or they're using, you know, I mean, look at Hokusai's for example. There's like an isometric feeling to it, but it's not using perspective. So creating the sense of creating the very first illusionistic imagery in terms of like space came from classical Greece. And so they would have these multi-level stages where they would perform plays, right, in amphitheaters. They invented the amphitheater, obviously. And then they would have these murals that were painted between the columns of the stage. And that would have the illusion of a 3D space so that the actor would be standing in front of an illusionary scene that goes behind them. Not, not plotted perspective, although they did invent optics. But that's sort of where it starts. So like representation, when I say representational, I mean not decorative, not like a geometric pattern, let's say. But representational art, it, it doesn't be, and that, that spatial illusion, this trompe l'oeil effect, where it's like we're looking into a 3D, so it's a, a poor person's sculpture. It's a, it's a fake sculpture. It's a fake environment. That starts with the ancient Greeks, and it's got nothing to do with perspective. And so I believe that sculpture is really the key to that because the old masters, Bernini, Titian, Michelangelo, all of them, um, Leonardo and Dürer were kind of special exceptions. I, I, I can get into it another time. But they all, they all would make clay wax models called Bozzetti or sketch models. They would make models in order to produce those paintings. So they would have an idea, they would draw from imagination, they would make little simple little wax models, almost like a mannequin. They'd make little simple models, and then they would draw from those models with natural lighting, like from a window, and then they would imagine the details and the anatomy and the patterns based on other designs they had. So the actual process of the old masters, who I admired the most, was a 2D, 3D uh, hybrid. That was their approach. And they would also work from models, live models, they would do studies of models and such. And so really, when it comes to 3D thinking, for me, it's more about surfaces. So in other words, it's more about, if you were to cover me in shrink wrap, if you were to shrink wrap me and in, in vacuum seal me in rubber, and it was just a rubber, and then you sealed the whole scene in rubber, that's what's important. It's those surfaces. And perspective can help you get those surfaces right, but it's not a perspective problem. It can be done orthographically and you wouldn't even notice. It's a, it's a, it's a three-dimensional thinking problem, but it's more what the old masters called relievo. So it's more about, it's more like relief sculpt. Like for example, relief sculpture is a great idea, low relief sculpture, right? So low relief sculpture is a drawing with a feeling of dimension. It's not a perspective scene that's cogent and co or coherent. So I think that, uh, yeah, sculpture is probably the best skill. Leonardo was a sculptor. Verrocchio was a sculptor. Michelangelo was a sculptor. The Titian was a sculptor in terms of building these models. They would also use the sculptures of other people and they would insert that in. So I think that that's really, I think sculpture and, and, and modeling are really a key to a kind of 3D thinking, a kind of a relievo 3D thinking that is actually more important than perspective. And then I think perspective is another later tool that can also be used. So I wouldn't start people with perspective if you want to learn to think three-dimensionally. I would start with not copying optically, learning to work from imagination, but essentially learning about, in learning simple volumes, but essentially it's about this. It's about this curved 
surface. This is what it's about. It's not so much about the one point or whatever, in terms of the representation of the figure, especially. Obviously, if you're doing perspective scenes for architecture or you're doing perspective specific things, it is more, more about that. So that, that's one way in which I, I think it's I think it's galaxy brain for sure, because when you can vis modeling and, and sculpting in clay, they, that allows you to visualize in 3D. So the more you do that stuff, the more you can visualize a 3D object and turn it in your mind. It's a skill. So I could vaguely kind of do it when I was starting. I can do it much better now. That skill of being able to visualize the volumes and the form, and in Juliet Aristides is a figure drawing book. I have a, I'm on the section for volume where I'm trying to illustrate that. I have some drawings that illustrate that in her book. But essentially being able to visualize those volumes, when I'm drawing, that's like the most useful skill because I can visualize the form on the page and then I can just choose whichever lines I want to explain that and I have all those choices. That's very different than somebody who is just doing the lines that they were taught in like a recipe where they're not really able to visualize. So I find like that visualization ability is something you get from modeling and sculpture and also just understanding the real form of the body. Because you can do these planar things or these constructions forever like it, and you'll never know how inaccurate they are because they're not really 3D and you never have to turn it and you never have to, you can deceive yourself and you can use constructions that actually aren't strong because you're not aware that they have contradictions in 3D. All that kind of stuff is alleviated by learning how to model and sculpt. The plant fell. Okay, we, we have one question. Yeah. Uh, uh, what was the drawing book you, you just mentioned? Uh, uh, I was asking. It's by, yeah, it's Juliet Aristides's book. They didn't catch that. Yeah, I'm trying to remember the name of it. She's done like four books. It's the one on uh, it's the one on figure. I have I'll have to find it. I'm sorry. I'm sure somebody can somebody somebody in the audience I'm sure has it. I don't remember the name of it. I think it's called Figure Drawing right. Atelier, not Classical Drawing Atelier. That was her first book. It's Figure Drawing Atelier. Yeah, and so uh, Glenn Vilpu and I. Uh, are in that book. I'm in the section on volume where that's when I'm trying to show artists that you need to be thinking of these as 3D volumes. And, and that's something that dynamic sketching and a lot of the other that draw box and stuff cover, but it's not the same, it's not really the same thinking. This is more a visualization of like a virtual fictive clay. So I'm like modeling with clay. So I'm making these round forms in the drawing visually and I'm visualizing it and then I'm adding the specific designs. That, that's different than uh, than plotting something or putting something into a box, for example. That's the distinction. Yeah, yeah. Juliet Aristides figure drawing yeah. Atelier. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I, you got it down in the chat. Um, <laughs> so you always talk about obviously old masters and how we should learn from them. And obviously um, talking about volume, you always uh, talk about like, drawing uh, the face as an egg, you know, and stuff like that. But um, wondering, um, how should I word this? Obviously, you mentioned a lot of Michelangelo, Tiepolo, um, you know, Raphael, and so on. Um, like, would you say those were your biggest inspirations? Or were for, there any others for, for, you mean for drawing? that inspired you with your art? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Like in term, like in terms of the artist that, like, I think the first art book I ever bought as a kid was a Hokusai book. I've always been a big fan of that uh, Yukio E period. Um, I, I have a, there's a lot of artwork that I like, you know. And when I was when I was growing up, I also liked comics. You know, I liked Jeff Smith, who did Bone. I liked Mobius. I liked manga. I liked a lot of the stuff that our that our students also, you know, shared that they liked. Um, I think that. After going to Europe as a teenager, what was shocking for me is because I had all the films and the entertainment and all the stuff that, you know, the video game stuff, the stuff that I liked. But when I when I got to see like Michelangelo's Pietà or the Sistine Chapel ceiling or the Torso Belvedere or these masterpieces, the the craftsmanship and the quality were so high that to me it was actually like mind boggling. And I never felt like that about any entertainment. I never saw a, a, a panel of comic or a scene from a movie where I couldn't see the craft. It didn't seem supernatural. It didn't seem superhuman to me, even at its best. So that's one thing about, and even with the ancient art, like the ancient Egyptian art, those pieces, when you're physically near them, 
they feel they they feel magical and sacred and somehow beyond humanity and they are beyond humanity in a way because they last for thousands of years and there's no digital file on a on a hard drive that's going to last like that and there's nothing so t for me it was like i didn't stop loving those things i still i still do enjoy all that but it was just like another class of mastery and once i got exposed to that directly and i had seen it a lot like as a kid my mother would take my brother and I to the Huntington Library, and we would, uh, you know, I saw Gainsborough's Blue Boy, which is a fantastic painting. If you don't know what that uh, is, you should look it up. I saw Gainsborough's Blue Boy at like six. So um, in Southern California growing up, you know, you, you know, you've obviously got Disneyland and you've got Hollywood and you've got all this stuff that I, that I grew into, but then there's also, there's also fantastic museums. So like the Getty, the Getty Museum, I would go there as, uh, as a young person a lot. And so my LACMA, you know, my LACMA once had an ancient Egyptian exhibit when I was a teenager I saw, and that blew me away. So it wasn't going to Europe for the first time, the first time I was exposed to those great masterpieces, but I think for me, uh, it was just the level of impossibility. It was the level of magic. It was the level of power that those works had that nothing in the entertainment, uh, which was more what my focus was when I was a teenager, it just didn't compete. It was, it was, a, it was a different kind. So once I got exposed to that, it was more over time that becoming more and more of my focus. And today, like today, the, the stuff I look at the most is ancient Greek, particularly uh, Hellenistic, because that's really the inspiration for everything that comes after it. You know, it's like you don't get the figure, you don't get figure art really before the ancient art. So they literally created the patterns and the motifs and the ways of thinking about it and, and that pers persevere to this day. Superman is a Greek, is a Greek god. You know what I mean? All the, what's the most popular media today? What's the biggest media? Well, it's these Marvel movies. Those are literally just a retelling, a reenactment, a repackaging of ancient Greek work. So it's um, unbelievable to me that this, uh, you know, thousands of years old, this uh, period of craftsmanship, especially out of Athena and Phidias and Myron and, uh, and all of that, that that stuff really changed the world of, of art, of representational art, and architecture, and music, and optics, and science, and philosophy, and poetry, and literature, and all of it. It's almost like they were like superhuman. It's unbelievable to me. And so that's sort of my current sort of obsession. But when I was starting out, it was much more diffuse. You know what I mean? I really liked, you know, I, I, I've, I like medieval uh, looking art as well. You know, I really like Tillman Riemenschneider. I like uh, Grunwald. I like uh, Bruegel. I like Hieronymus Bosch. I like Master ES. You know, I, I really, there's, a, there's so much, uh, I, I'm a big fan of Eastern art. And I also like uh, Turner and I like uh, the Golden Age illustrators and all that. But for me, I don't know what it is. It's just been over the years, it's just been the sifting back to sort of the ancient art. And that's sort of, today, that's what I'm thinking about most of the time. And so my drawing approach, because we don't really have the drawings of the ancient Egy uh, Greeks or Egyptians, because the ancient Egyptians drew with a brush or they would incise in stone but you wouldn't see their construction necessarily, although it has been reconstructed in the 70s, some of it. And then with the ancient Greeks, we just don't have, we don't have any paintings. So, and we, on, we only have very few originals. Most of it is Roman copies. So it's also like the, the mystery of it, the fact that they could do heads better than we can do them now. And they've been imitated so long, but how do they actually work? I find that to be a really fascinating problem. And so, but because they didn't, they don't leave behind the drawing tradition in an obvious way, most of the drawing tradition focus has been on sort of the Western masters, in particular Renaissance artists. So I sort of taught myself to draw by copying uh, Michelangelo, every one of Michelangelo's drawings from these books from the Logia. I know there's an interview with Ruxandra that I talk about that. I don't want to get into the story again. But I did sort of learn how to draw by copying Michelangelo's, all of them, over the course of three years by studying uh, anatomy and doing a lot of stuff that's outside of the that. But in terms of like the artistic inspiration, I think more and more, you realize that most of the stuff you like in this period is really Greek. And, and then you just, you don't realize it until you sort of trace that history back. And then you start realizing that, you know, it's always, it's, it's been Greek fan art ever since the Greeks, you know, uh, uh, ever since the classical period, it's all Greek fan art. And so I, I find that going to the source is the most, is the best place for inspiration. And they just, they, I think they just had the best taste and they balance things the best way. And there's a reason that you keep seeing neoclassical. Renaissance is basically neoclassical, then neoclassical, and then romantic, and then this constant return, even in entertainment art, this constant return to the Greeks. There, I think there's a reason for it. It's, it's, the, it's the immense quality of it. It's the superior quality of it.
Okay. Um, okay, let's go back to a bit more questions. Yes. Um, do you have any advice for getting to more actual finish pieces instead of doing lots of just studies and sketches? Um, yes. So. Like, did you ever, you know, have issues with that? Um, I took a really disciplined approach for myself, and so I wouldn't allow myself to move on until I felt like I had gotten enough earlier. But in students, I often discourage that. Like, I don't think I, I think that you wanna be disciplined, right? But at the same time, like let's say you're studying gesture and you're doing gesture drawings. And so I would have been doing that, you know, in 2010 probably with Glenn. So I'm, I'm, I'm studying with Glenn at, uh, at his home. I'm helping out. I'm coming to every class, wherever he's at, every workshop. He, I'm there, right? So I'm just there assisting him. And I'm in the class and I'm getting all this time in front of the model again and again and again. I'm doing Glenn's method. So I focused a, a long time on the gesture side, but what I should have done is I should have probably carried those through to final works because what happens is by going further with the gesture, you understand what the gesture is really there for. If you're just doing the gesture by itself, you're sort of, it's an abstract thing. So I think it is important to start. That's why, that's why in the drawing foundations, you know, drawing foundations, uh, one, you're doing like thumbnail compositions, you're doing finished art in the second course, which is Renee's fantastic uh, intro to perspective and drawing. I don't remember what the exact term name is for that, but in Renee's course and in food, which is uh, the Russian academic first part. So the first three courses of New Masters Academy, you have to do in a sorrow head or a still life. You have to do finished work. And the reason why is that when you do the finished work, you realize what all those preparatory stages are moving towards. And it helps anchor your work towards reality versus just drawing line exercises for six months where you don't know where they're gonna come in, in handy. And so I believe that you do wanna look ahead and then come back and drill those skills, but you need to be making that connection. But that's something that, you know, when I first started out, I had done like finished master studies as well. Like I had done finished drawings after Rubens that were very rendered out. And those really did help me knowing where I was going for, for the stuff that came in between because I could imitate it, but coming up with something like that on my own wasn't possible. So I knew that there was things that were missing. That's one thing you get when you when you do finish work is you start feeling what those gaps are. It's like, okay, I can kind of physically imitate this to a certain level, but I cert and so in Master Monday, for example, which is a, a live class I did, you guys can watch the DVR. In Master Monday, you're, you're doing these master studies. And again, I'm trying to improve on what I did, but then you're actually drawing, like you're drawing eyes after Fialetti, let's say. And then you have to draw eyes of real people from a photo, but you have to do them like Fialetti. And it's that, that is such a direct way to learn that I think that you actually learn faster if you're not just drilling one specific abstract thing. Because look, art is not geometry. There's no first principles. It's not, it's not a philosophical construction uh, only. It's something that happens in the brain. It's an activity. It has to do with visual perception and vision science, which I've studied independently. And those, those elements of vision science um, and how we perceive and how we communicate in the cultural aspects, these things are best taught by the master apprentice system, which was the oldest way that all the masters studied. And the master apprentice system was not about these philosophical ideas. Like imagine a plane of existence and then put a cross on it and then imagine a box and then put it, it's not like that. That's not how art is taught, it's, it's a craft. And so crafts are not taught that way. And while the, the contemporary audience really likes to think of it in terms of like a first principles, kind of a STEM kind of a way, you know, like they want to make it Euclidean and they wanted to make it Euclidean for centuries. If you look at the training manuals and stuff, which I collect, like I have the first drawing book of all uh, ever produced by Ordo Water Fialetti. It's, uh, it's like 500 years old. First how to draw book in history. I have the original and I've tracked all of those manuals since then up to 20th century. And looking at the manuals, it's clear that they, like Leonardo wanted this, they wanted it to be like a platonic, conceptual, this builds that, this builds that, but in reality, that's not how the craft is taught practically. And I don't think it's, I don't think it's a successful pattern. I think we need to think of it more like a activity. It's a physical activity and there's a way to do it and, and, and that's the best way to learn it rather than making it too abstract. Okay, um, okay let's move to the next question. Sure. How do you, self-assess yourself and make uh, realistic short and mid-term goals? I think for me, the self-assessment is always a comparison to the old masters. That's the easiest way. So um, 
theoretically, if you were to achieve that level, <laughs> theoretically, no one alive has done it, then you'd have to figure something else out. But for now, like for right now, I'm, I'm carving a, the head of Venus of Milos. And that's an ancient sculpture. It's, it's a Hellenistic sculpture. It's, uh, it's so funny because going into it, I thought I knew what was happening in the sculpture because I've been studying this stuff for you know 15 years. And when actually doing it, though, I realized the, constru the sculpture is not constructed the way I would have assumed. It's not constructed the way Bernini would have done it. It's, it's, it's a different thing. It's a series of curves and patches. And it's very, like, logical and... Um, but at the same time, incredibly subtle and soft and sophisticated. And so, like, even now I'm learning... Like, the ancient sculptor who created uh, Venus of Milos is my teacher right now. And I'm doing that in the studio. And being able to learn how to learn from the masters and then try to achieve technically what they did, which is incredibly difficult, and then figure out a way to internalize that and then do it on your own, that to me is the greatest teacher uh, that we have. When you're starting out, you know, there, there's so much expertise and mastery available today to help you get to the next level. But at some point when you start getting more advanced, the only teachers you can look to are the masters because they're the only ones who are I mean because the, the best sculpture teachers in the world these are colleagues of mine these are people that I know and have relationships with this is you know uh, Robert Bodum and this is uh, Ed Froughton and Richard McDonald you know uh, and, and artists like this and Bruno Walpoff you know so the best sculptors in the world I know them and I do also study their work and I, and I listen to their teaching and I try to learn as much as I can from them but at the same time my target is 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 more in line with uh, the old masters and, and the antique, and so for me, the, those are the only teachers who can teach me. So, uh, you know, uh, David Simon's fantastic, but if these artists don't know what they, those masters knew, they can't give it to you. So that's I think that's the that's the way of self-assessing your work that will last, you know, your entire career. And if by some miraculous capability, you're able to match the quality of Michelangelo. Well, then you would, or or these masters, then you, then you would be on your own. But we're not we're not there. Interesting, interesting, interesting. <laughs> okay, um, I have an interesting question here, which okay. uh, probably a lot of young artists and artists in general now like have issues with: how to build patience when you're drawing because everybody wants to do like quick sketches yeah but they find it really hard to you know come back to one piece over and over again for like hours for days like, yeah do you have any advice on yeah so I, I, I think that's more of a contemporary issue and the reason why is because that's not traditionally you were not in a traditional workshop like let's say you were you were learning art and you were a child and you were in you were in the workshop of Tintoretto or whatever and they would start you, and this is what Drawing One is, this is what Master Monday is about, this is how I've constructed my teaching, but they would start, you would learn how to start drawing, probably as a child, by copying the drawings of the eyes, the nose, the mouth by the masters. You would copy these drawings and then learn how to put those into an egg, et cetera, et cetera. The idea that you stick somebody in front of a live figure model and there's music playing and they're like doing all these crazy poses. This is, this is how figure models move in my mind. Um, they do all these crazy poses and you're supposed to just capture it. That's completely 20th century. They did not do that. Um, it's a real bad idea. <laughs> and the reason it's a bad idea is that the students are absolutely hopeless. There's no possible way they can make a good drawing because they haven't learned how to draw yet. You're throwing them into a figure drawing session. The figure is the most complex subject matter because of our the complexity of the biology, but also because of our evolutionary wiring and sexual selection pressures and psychological pressures and everything. And we're so sensitive to when it's wrong. So I think the problem now is that everyone rushes into heads and figures because they want to do characters, they want to do comics, they want to do whatever, but that's just not a good method. So we don't start with the figure. I think there are, that's more typical, but we don't start with the figure. We don't start with illustration techniques. We start with basic drawing techniques. So you need that basic drawing ability before you touch the figure in order to be successful. But part of this, I think it's the influence of entertainment art is probably the most relevant art form that people connect with, right? So most people have experiences with Marvel movies, but they're not necessarily gonna ever have stepped into a museum, let's say. So I think that the fact that the most dominant art forms are in the entertainment field and what what does comic books and animation have in common, 
fast, right? So if you're doing comics, you have to do, you're, you might get paid $120 for an entire page. So it's boom, 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 boom. It's 20th century American illustration. Uh, it's basically like the original like pulp artists that preceded comic books and stuff, they were the cheap illustrators. So if you weren't making $160,000 living in Manhattan working for, this wasn't Mad Men. Those were the successful illustrators. If you're doing comics, it was because you couldn't get there, right? So you were doing pulp covers and illustration covers, but you had to turn these things around fast. So the drawing techniques of that field are all about speed. You know, it's speed, speed, speed techniques. Animation, same thing. You're doing thousands of frames of animation. It's gotta be fast, fast, fast. So the characters have to be simple. And so there are aesthetic and drawing considerations that get inherited from entertainment due to the nature of it, which is very different than Leonardo spending years perfecting these curves on, on a painting of his, for example. So I think that um, that quick, 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 direct, 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 big shape, triangle, black to white, contrast, bam, 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 all that kind of energy. If you use that as a foundational training, there's gonna be side effects and downsides. And those are the downsides that I think we're running into today. We're trying to jump right into character design and illustration and we have no business doing that. We need to learn how to draw comics, animation, all these things, they're applications of drawing fundamentals. They are not a replacement for drawing fundamentals. So that's the big problem I see in education is that especially online, the popular people online, whether they're on YouTube or they have a website or whatever, they're mostly giving you illustration techniques right at the beginning, which is a huge mistake because if you just learn those techniques and you don't learn how to properly draw, you're just gonna be limited. You can't compete with people in those fields who actually can draw as well. And a lot of times your favorite you know, manga artist can also draw really well. And they also might've went to art school and then they ended up doing manga, but if you're just copying their illustrations for manga, you're never gonna be able to achieve what they can achieve. So I do, I do see that as being a big issue. And so not being willing to finish anything, somebody in the community was just asking, do I need to learn how to render a sphere to do animation? And there was like conflicted advice for it. Well, it's like, of course, you need to learn how to draw, you need to understand light. You can't decide how the, how the light separation on the character works unless you understand light. If you're looking at a reference or you're taking video of yourself to use as reference for your animation, you can't interpret the reality. You can't even see anything unless you understand light. And so I think that's the biggest gap that, and that's sort of where New Masters Academy comes in, or at least a decade ago, was because, you know, and Bill Perkins was on the hiring committee for Disney and other studios. He's, the, our instructors, many of them, Glenn was running CalArts' drawing uh, department, which was the training for, for Disney. So a lot of the, our instructors are experts in portfolio. They're experts in hiring for studios. They're experts in art school, top art school, art center, for example, hiring for that or, uh, you know, uh, doing reviews for that. And they know what the weaknesses are. And we compiled those weaknesses. And the weaknesses are the students can only imitate. Everyone trying to get an art center has a portfolio that looks identical. They're just watching the same, uh, looking at the same artists, imitating the same thing, but they don't have the flexibility, which you need in entertainment. Because if you're working on one show and then you work on a totally different show with a different style and you can't adapt your style, you're not, a, you're not gonna be successful at entertainment. So the irony is everybody's imitating the illustration and entertainment styles. They don't wanna learn how to draw properly, but that also will sabotage them from becoming successful or a leader in those fields anyway. So if you wanna be a really popular, really successful entertainment artist, you need the foundations more than anybody. That's the big issue I see. So yeah, you need to learn how to finish things and think carefully and iterate and work through stages because that's most of art history. And, and then you can learn the application of specifically, you know, what, what you're interested in doing as a career. But I don't think you want to start with that, you know. Yeah, you want to start slow and not rush it into the cool stuff. I mean, Walt Disney <laughs> didn't hire the best animators because there, weren't, there, weren't, there wasn't such a thing. He hired the best artists. They were illustrators and draftspeople and fine artists of different kinds. And then they learned how to do Mickey Mouse and all this stuff. And then that's how you get Fantasia. And that's how you get the best animation quality of all time. That golden age of Disney, they were not animators because animation was new. So I think that says a lot that it's not, you don't want it to be incestuous. You want to have outside artistic influences and you're bringing that to your application. That's what's more important. Okay. Uh, very insightful. Um, in your experience of coaching many students, 
what non-artistic qualities do you find most common in students who you you would say succeed you know in art it, in, it's definitely it's definitely endurance uh it's definitely endurance you know um the best drafts people i know uh glenn vilpu told me this steve Houston told me this as well they were not the strongest students in their class they weren't the best at drawing they weren't the most talented in other words they weren't the most naturally gifted but they got to the level of mastery that they're at today through persistence over time just continuing to focus on the problem of masterful drawing not just working on projects as a professional and not just um moving on to express themselves but specifically continuing to try to improve their craft for decades that's what gives them the advantage so whether you are naturally gifted or not whether you are uh drew as a child or whether you're the strongest in your class or not it doesn't actually that's not the most important thing the most important thing is just persistence patience we, we were talking about patience earlier um about feeling frustrated or whatever it's that patience that is that is the key aspect of success in art. And so if you feel frustrated, like you want to rush ahead, you want to rush ahead, that is a self-sabotaging attitude and you will never be successful. You might, you know, there are people who, do they deal with imposter syndrome every day. But there are people who their drawing foundations aren't that strong and they do work in entertainment. You know, uh, there might be a prop artist or a 3D artist or doing whatever, but it haunts them for many years and they always want to go back and learn it because they feel like a phony because they have to trace or they have to copy or they have to use techniques and they, they can't work out certain compositional solutions. They're, they're just limited. So it's not that you can't get a job, but also I don't care about what the bot, I don't care, I'm not interested in what the low bar is to working in entertainment, you know? That's what people are like, well, what do I need to work in entertainment? My answer is I don't care because that's a low bar. We should be aspiring to do great art. That's what New Masters Academy is about. If you're not trying to be great at art, then that's you're not so much in the spirit of what we're doing here, although you'll still benefit from it. So I'm not interested in making mediocre art that AI is, is replacing, you know what I mean? I'm not interested in making worthless art. You know, art that's cheap, it's fast, it's common, it'll be forgotten immediately. I'm interested in making work that is of quality, that is a human experience, that is something that inspires those who see it to aspire to more improvement and cultivation and mastery within themselves that's the kind of art I'm interested in. That's what New Masters is founded on. The instructors feel the same for the most part. I'm sure they would all agree with that. So patience is the name of the game. It's not a target oh, you're trying to get to. It is you need to learn how to fall in love with the act of creating and you need to fall in love with not, you need to get your dopamine hits not from talking about it or you know, you need to get your dopamine hits from the improvement that you see every day. If you can train yourself to do that, if you can just will it, you can, you know, my mother was, uh, she, she was, she believed in the idea of manifestation. That's how she would have put it. She would say that you need to be able to visualize it. But I think it's more about the day to day, waking up, getting dressed, putting on your shoes, getting your coffee, going into the studio, trying to make something, giving it your full attention as long as you can, thinking about it afterwards, finding a way to improve it, doing it again, and then sharing that as part of it. But it's really your life as an artist is really about that day to day. It's just like, learn, it's like getting fit, dude. People who get in shape, they start running, they hate every minute of it, but at some point they start getting that runner's high, they start feeling confident, it starts becoming a thing, and then they love it. You couldn't stop them from running. It's a little bit like that with art. If you just sketch casually or doodle or do it a little bit, it's never gonna move to the next level. You have to actually become that artist that you wanna be and learn how to love that. You need to, I've said this many times, but mastery does not, here, when we're, when we're a beginner, we think that uh, mastery is, is like a superpower that we get. So we upload into the matrix, now I'm a master. So now I am the same person, but now I can do unbelievable paintings. That's not true. The reality is that mastery doesn't come to you. You have to come to mastery. You have to change. You have to change as a person to become, a, there is no version of you as you are now that is a master. It will be another person because, because that is a slow, increasing your resilience and focusing more and more, reducing distraction more and more, feeling that getting, getting addicted to the positive stuff rather than getting addicted to the stuff that's self-destructive, right? So maybe, you know, you're gonna watch uh, Netflix until five in the morning and feel like shit and then go to bed, wake up late, 
feel bad about yourself. Like that's kind of an addictive thing that we can get into where it's just like binging entertainment or playing, you know, uh, playing a game and all night long and you feel terrible. Well, if you, if you can trick your psychology into spending that kind of energy on creating art, you're going to wake up the next day feeling fantastic and you have more confidence and you're, you're healthier and your mood is better. You know, and if you can balance the rest of your life so that you're eating healthy and you have your social needs are met and you have important relationships and, and, and you're also putting that time in, I think that's the best, that's the best life imaginable. I can't imagine a better life than the life of an artist, you know, because you're creating something that's an act of love and you're giving that to others and you're inspiring other people and making them feel happy. But you have to think of it that way. You need to change. You can't just continue to have your same habits and mastery. It's not like that. It's like becoming a professional athlete. You're not going to look the way you look now if you become a master. You're going to be a different person. And I think that that's really important. Once you understand that, then it's more about getting closer and closer to that model, that ideal, that idea that you have of what that master, what that, what that master version of yourself is. I think that's more what it actually is like and less of just learning the right techniques or learning the right ideas and then you can just it's easy for you it's, it's never easy for anybody uh, it, when matt when a master creates a masterpiece it's difficult for them because they're just working at a higher level than you are but they're trying to push it further that never ends yeah yeah okay um okay uh we have a few more minutes left great um, where is your comfort zone when it comes to art and why would you say that's your comfort zone? I don't know if I understand. Like, what would I be uncomfortable drawing or doing? No, just what's your comfort zone when you are drawing? So basically, if you would go and do, I guess, do, like mindlessly draw, what would you actually draw? Like, what's the comfort zone in your drawings? Um, I think my focus is the figure. So if I'm drawing something, I'm probably drawing the figure. But at the same time, you know, you can see this on like my Instagram or whatever, but I've, I've done lots of other subject matter. I've done animals, I've done uh, landscapes, I've done plants, I've done geometric designs. I spent a lot of time doing ornamental, studying ornamental design, uh, flourishes, things like that. I'm interested in a lot of a lot of different things. I actually, I'm not known as a perspective person, but I've done a lot of work on advanced perspective. I even developed my own perspective drawing technique that does not involve vanishing points, but allows you to plot perspective from an object in curvilinear. So I've done a lot. So I have a lot of comfort in that kind of stuff, but definitely I think the figure and the head, those are my, those are my, my focus. Those are my go-tos. And if I get to draw something else, I don't feel uncomfortable. I actually feel extremely confident. So like if I draw a tree or something, I'm like bringing, cause the figure is much harder. So I'm bringing all of that energy into a tree and I'm just feeling like uh, there's a lot of confidence there if I draw other subject matter because I find it all much more, uh, much easier than the figure. I think the figure is the most difficult thing. Um, so, but I would say, you know, I don't have as much experience painting. So I've done painting and I want to eventually get into painting but not before I'm doing, you know, the big monumental uh, marble sculptures that we have planned. But I would like to get into painting. I would like to, I would like to get, I would like to build the kind of comfort with a paintbrush that I have with drawing. So that would be something that, you know, I wouldn't, I'm not as confident, uh, not nearly as confident in paint, but I would like to develop that. And then, um, you know, I even like cartooning, you know what I mean? Like I've, uh, I've done uh, animation, uh, cartooning courses before. I really enjoy that. I've done character design. I find that really fun to me. Like drawing is a joy. I, I don't get filled with dread and anxiety so much while drawing. It's something that it's something that I love to do, but, um, yeah, definitely figure would be the most, the most comfortable area. Yeah. I was, I was sure you were going to be like saying anatomy or something like that, because we know you as like the, anatomy guy basically you always talk about anatomy That's like funny. um you also did like a uh, like a life course from anatomy there is a workshop coming up uh, yeah i mean ana anatomy, anatomy is something I've, I've definitely focused on a lot well. but i mean that's what the figure is though the figure is anatomy and you can you can interpret the anatomy you can yeah. interpret the anatomy based on abstract curves of the body but essentially when you're drawing anything organic you are drawing anatomy whether or not you realize it and so to me anatomy is like knowing your subject matter so for example if you were going to become a, uh, an auto designer you need to learn what a chassis is and a transmission you need to learn 
about powering the car? Is there a battery? Where does it go? You basically, the more you understand about the construction of a, a vehicle, the better of a designer you can be, and it's required, right? Well, the same thing is true of the figure. If you don't know what a hand, what a hand looks like, you can't draw it. And so the best way to understand the hand, for example, is understanding the bones of the forearm and knowing which side, which side is the ulna and which side is the radius? Or is it which side is the radius and which side is the ulna? How does this turn? How does the wrist move? What, what is going on with the wrist? Like, what is the form that best represents the wrist? How does the hand articulate? What are the direction of the fingers? What's the proportional breakdown of every section of that? All that is required information to do a masterful uh, drawing of a hand. And so for me, anatomy is the, the content, the subject matter that you must master in order to master any depictions of characters or the figure. Unless it is a highly simplified, highly stylized thing where, you know what I mean, where it could be just about that flat pattern, for example. But if you want to do representational illusionistic work, that's anatomy. And anatomy is something I studied more than any other artist I've ever met. Uh, I've spent more time on it. And I've gone deeper on anatomy than any artist, any of my colleagues that I know. I uh, built a human body from the inside out. I have a collection of real skeletons, and I've got cadet, the Elliot Goldfinger, you know, castings of cadavers. I've got Elliot Goldfinger skeleton. I've got a ton of skulls. You can see some of them behind me. I've built models of the human body from the inside out multiple times. I've done FEM simulations and joint movements, and I've taught anatomy workshops and taught anatomy classes. And we are doing actually, uh, there's actually still spots for this available. So we actually have an anatomy workshop in Santa Fe coming up uh, in, in, uh, in November. And this is a ecorche workshop where I'm gonna be teaching the entire body. Like you see this little plaster figurine, this Houdin ecorche. Students are actually gonna be making that and I'm gonna walk them through that, which I think is the best way to learn anatomy is a 2D, 3D combo. But uh, Glenn Vilpu is another instructor, uh, Johanna and uh, Ray Bustos, who I think is the best anatomy teacher in the world. He's gonna be there assisting. So we're, we're doing a big anatomy workshop. If you're interested in learning anatomy, you should definitely check that out. Uh, there's still spots available. It's a big venue. It's gonna be really exciting to do. And so yeah, anatomy, anatomy is absolutely huge if you're interested in anything human or anything human-esque. If you're doing like these furry characters, you still need to know human anatomy. If you're doing creatures, you still need to use human anatomy because using human anatomy as, for, as the, the model for comparative anatomy allows you to understand the skeleton of a bird. If you're just looking at the skeleton of a bird and you don't know the human anatomy, you're starting from scratch every time. So understanding human anatomy also allows you to, to master uh, animals and creatures and create new things. So it's, it's incredibly important it's really key and that's something that the ancient Greeks were doing they were studying the natural anatomy of the human figure that's something that the old masters did Leonardo da Vinci Michelangelo they were all dissecting cadavers and drawing those dissections Vasilius Albinus and uh, Jan van der Laar uh, these are all artists like anatomy is directly related to figure art and it's a requirement if you want to do anything uh, more naturalistic than you know Powerpuff Girls or whatever yeah. That, that was an interesting person, Buffer Buff Girls. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so, <laughs> so yeah, uh, 10 years, New Masters Academy. Um, it's awesome. It's big. It's huge. Um, obviously, it? it's getting bigger and bigger. There, we have a lot of events going on. Yeah. Like, a lot of workshops are starting to come out this year. Like, the Tuscany one was sold out in what an hour uh yeah hour? yeah so there were some people internally who that had was a, pretty fast. yeah the, the, the we so we did a we booked a castle in in tuscany outside of florence and to do a to do a workshop where we're going to be i'm going to be teaching traditional traditional drawing i'm going to be contextualizing how the artists of the renaissance and the and the, and the baroque artists were using that stuff and we're going to be going to the museums and we're going to be studying in the Uffizi, at the Piazza della Signorina, at the Loggia. We're going to be going to and seeing, you know, these masterpieces, some of the greatest masterpieces of all time, and drawing at the castle. So that, that's an event. That's our first destination event. Uh, there's a website, destination.nma.art. That was our first one. We announced it um, a few months ago. And, yeah, it sold out within three hours. So that, that castle is completely booked out. The anatomy workshop is a much bigger venue. We can actually like it, it's a it's got a larger capacity, and that is still available. But I think that probably uh, it, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> we'll see how we'll see how exhausting it is. But I think that 
destinations are something that we may continue to do. We're, we're looking at that. We're also, you know, publishing books now. We published the Vilpu Drawing Manual this year. We're planning new books. We're planning a Drawbox book with Urshad. We're planning a composition book with Bill Perkins. So I think there's going to be, outside of the New Masters Academy's, you know, primary uh, focus of being an online art school and online community, we're going to be doing some of these other things as well. And uh, there might be even workshops because uh, we're moving New Masters Academy from California to where I am in Colorado. So we just bought a piece of land. We're going to be building new studios. We're going to be like building a, a better situation for the company where we might be able to have events or uh, activities here. At actual, you could actually go to New Masters Academy and do a thing, which is really cool uh, because we haven't had these live classes in person since uh, since our mentors before COVID. So. That's pretty exciting. It's, it's not coming to my ranch, just to be clear. We've bought another. We bought a, it's, it's going to be a new ranch, basically. That's that's like, you know, 20 minutes from me. And there goes our dreams, <laughs> the the Jacobo <laughs> Ranch. <laughs> oh, it's a, it's a, dude, it's amazing. There's a there's a can there's a canyon on this property. We we are. I mean, we're in escrow right now, but there's a canyon on the property. There's like a little stream that runs through it. Uh, it, it's got all this beautiful natural beauty to it. You look around, you see the La Plata Mountains, you see Mesa Verde where the cliff dwellers are. It's, an, it's a national monument, right? You see, you can see, it's, it's absolutely serene. Basically the theme is Cowboy Hogwarts. That's what we're going for. So this is supposed to be, there's no other art school like it. You know, maybe in Idlewild there's a youth school that's more, but it's the idea of like combining nature with the best art. Cause art has typically happened in the big cities. That's where it happens. It's, LA and New York and Paris and Florence, but this idea of being able to, because I've left the city life coming out here and I feel like my life is much better now. And this, and I, that's what's happening. There's a COVID migration. People are leaving you know, San Francisco and these other cities and they're spreading out throughout the country in the United States. And I think that that's a trend. I think quality of life, connection to nature, in-person connection. I think in the future, as jobs stay remote, you know, they went remote during COVID, a lot of them, and they're staying remote. I think the future is actually more of a spreading out and getting more in connection with nature. So um, that's why I, I feel like, even though it seems weird that new masters would not be in Los Angeles, I think that it actually makes more sense. And I think that there's more of a future in spreading out and getting in touch with the things that actually make us happy. And a lot of that is, is nature and, and being, being up close with it and smelling it and yeah. touching grass and things like that. And so I'm very interested in this, like what, because also we have the internet, we have fast internet everywhere and we have the technology to do it. So why on earth, why would we be in a overcrowded, expensive, dangerous, you know, situation when we could actually really spread out and instead of having a studio in an industrial park next to all these other things. And there's, you know, in it's parking hard. Imagine just spreading out and just having like a big, beautiful open, uh, ranch and maybe even a sculpture garden, maybe even doing like a uh, Huntington Library kind of a thing out here. I'm I'm really interested in that for the future. And bears, yeah. <laughs> That's right. I was about to comment like we can get a bear over there for like some drawing sections. There, there's we know, have on our ranch. Model. <laughs> there's a bear and there's also a mountain lion and <laughs> and and a, and a bobcat that live on the ranch. And, and elk and wild turkey and bald eagles and golden eagles and turkey vultures and just it's 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 so much nature out here it's unbelievable and it actually lowers your anxiety and it actually um, being here I feel like it you just feel healthier you feel better you know what I mean uh, and and I, I would I would like to share that if possible well, the air is better yeah yeah, yeah. that's awesome. Okay, uh, would you, I mean, we're already at one hour point. Would you like to do any more questions? Sure. Or would you like to discuss a rumor I have been hearing? Well, so questions? Yeah, let's, let's do a couple more questions and then I'll do the announcement. Okay, just give me one second. Yeah, um, pull that up. Okay, we have an one question about common bad habits that you see in students that you uh, teach like what should you know people avoid what kind of bad habits to avoid there's so many uh, <laughs> i think impatience is the worst one impatience top five. Yeah, impatience so you you are trying to rush ahead 
like let's say you 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 follow an artist who does like illustrations and they're they're using 3D and then they're doing digital painting and it has a certain look. You're trying to like rush into that and you don't have the patience to learn proper drawing. I think that's that's one of the most killer things because it's a delusional it's a delusional place to be in and so you're going to ignore good advice from people you should be listening to because you're you're just like you're trying to compromise with reality. So I feel like delusional thinking is probably one of the most destructive things and that also manifests itself in in, in impatience. So I'm going to spend one year mastering drawing and then I want to work, start working in Unity Engine to make my game. No chance. Impossible, right? So not acknowledging that. So I think impatience, uh, rushing, you're missing the point. You're, you're never going to succeed that way. That's, that's a big thing. Um, another problem, I think, is, is trusting the wrong sources. So you shouldn't be learning art on YouTube. You shouldn't be, you shouldn't, you want to, look, traditionally it's the master apprentice system. So your teacher is Michelangelo. Your teacher is Leonardo. That, that's the traditional thing. And that's how the best quality gets passed on. Today you have all these industries and you've got drawing books out there. There's thousands of drawing books by people who don't know how to draw. You know, there's thousands of drawing classes by people who are bad at drawing. And so the other thing is sort of following leaders and following advice, general advice, you know, something you're on, a, you're on a Reddit channel and there's a bunch of artists and you're asking them what you need to be able to get into this industry and people are telling you, well, those people don't know. So one thing that students don't do that they should do is they should look at the actual qualifications of their teacher. They should not just take a class because you like the teacher because with the internet, there, there, it, there's new master's academy, you know. There, what was that? Yeah, that's another thing too. The, another thing is that if you found a qualified teacher, which is most people don't have a qualified teacher, and they think they do, just because just it's popular does not mean it's good. <laughs> I have to say that. But when you do have a, a qualified instructor and if you're able to get interactivity, which is key, without interactivity, it's very difficult to succeed. It's very difficult to succeed without cr regular strategic critique by, an, by, a, uh, by an instructor who's qualified. The other part is actually trusting your teacher. So if a student comes in and they're arguing with the teacher on a critique, that's a huge red flag. Because if they're doing that, it means that they're insecure and they don't actually want to, what they really are hoping for is praise. You did such a great job on this, fantastic. Oh, you're so good. So, so not being able to take a critique and not be able to trust your teacher, that's another thing. So, I mean, we could, we could go all day. I don't know how many of these we want to do. But uh, most of them come down to attitude. It comes down to attitude. Lack of humility, delusional thinking, impatience, uh, lack of curiosity, um, not, being, not, not thinking deeply or having the proper reverence and respect for the craft. These are the kinds of things that tend to... Yeah, and, and also like cr crippling self-doubt. Um, misunderstanding that art is a craft and anybody can learn it and misunderstanding that art is a gift from God and some of us are geniuses and some of us are not and we need to discover whether our horoscope, blah, 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 blah. Am I, am I supposed to do this? Does the universe want me to do this? Am I an artist or am I a fraud? Am I, all that kind of self, uh, all that sort of uh, self-disparaging, that's completely useless. That's also a huge waste of time. That's also a red flag. But it mostly comes down to attitude. It's not about intelligence or IQ or whatever, although that stuff will help you. It's not about memory. It's not about how well you can visualize spatially. It's, it's just about how, if, if you have the right attitude and if you're willing to learn and to build those skills and the patience to do so. That's what determines a successful artist over time. Um, those are the most important things. And yeah, so those are the red flags that if I see that with a student, I need to work with them on that because that's gonna sabotage everything else we're talking about. Like if they get really upset about a critique, that's a huge red flag. Like, oh, I don't know why the teacher said this because somebody else posted a thing and then I posted my thing and they hardly said anything positive at all. And they said that if you're in that space, like if you're in that headspace, you're setting yourself up for failure and you'll probably quit. So you have to adjust the attitude first. You know what I mean? Think of a, I know you guys love manga. Think of work, work a, think of a kung fu movie. You come, you, you know, you come to the master, you seek their teaching, you do it. It's like that. The master apprentice stories of manga are based on the early Buddhist stories of like Mila Repa. And it always comes down to the master and the teacher. That's what it is. I'm sorry if you don't like the word master. I'm sorry if you don't like authoritarian uh, constructs. I'm sorry if you don't like hierarchy, but without that, you don't have a chance. 
you have no chance whatsoever because it's too complicated and the best way to get the information is through it, it's a handed down tradition it's a handed down that's the best way to get it so if you're trying to circumvent that because your pride or your ego won't allow it you're not going to you're not going to be successful unfortunately change yourself first and then and then the things you want will come yeah, yeah, and obviously trust the person that's guiding you. That's, Dude, if you if you want to become a boxer, you know what I mean, and you don't want to you don't want to go to a gym and study under an experienced coach, and you're just gonna invent boxing on your own, you're gonna get your head knocked off. Like, there's no way you can be competitive. You absolutely need to have a master uh, or a highly qualified instructor who is working with you on your work, and that's that's the key. It's not conceptual. It's not, if you understand the concepts, you'll succeed. You need that because you can't see the ways in which your art is not working. Because if you could see it, you wouldn't do it like that. So you're, you, you, everyone has done in Kruger. We're all blind to the ways in which our art is awful. And it's a teacher that's able to see that and help you guide you through it. And it, it's not something you can, you can't self-assess your way to mastery. It's not possible. You need that feedback. Not in one lifetime yeah. anyway. Yeah, trust the process. Trust the process, but make sure you have qualified okay, teachers. Okay, let's take one more. Yeah. yeah. Uh, let's take one more question, and then we'll talk about the rumor that I mentioned before. Yes. And we'll wrap it up with that. Um, okay, AI. Just one question about AI. Okay. Um, so with the rise, uh, the rise of AI and its negative impacts on the digital arts, do you think digital artists still have a chance in creative careers like concept art and animation? And with the, the uh, and with that, will more people move back and embrace traditional art because of it? So predicting what the industry is going to do is probably that's different than predicting like what is the future hold for art. So I mean, look at what Disney and Marvel and all these companies have been making massive layoffs in the last few months. So like 12,000 people get laid off here, entire visual development department there. Uh, the tech companies are doing that too. Uh, some people who are following this stuff believe that supposedly the layoffs were about uh, you know quarterly earnings reports, et cetera, et cetera. In reality, the layoffs are preemptive because they're already using AI and they need to get rid of that staff, especially if the staff is unionized or looking to unionize. So I think what's probably happening right now are studios around the world are cutting the throats of employees now be, so that it's easier to get away with than, than later once everyone is sort of caught up for what's going on. I do think that is related to AI and it's not just an earnings thing. I think that, look, this, look, entertainment art is all about a bottom line. You're investing $100 million and you're trying to make a profit. You've got shareholders, you have a fiduciary duty to maximize profits. This, ha this was a big conversation in the 90s when like The Simpsons was going to Korea or Marvel was going to the Philippines where they were driving down the cost of, uh, the, the, cost of the labor. They used to have, you know, in the golden age illustration and stuff, you would have people who had like jobs with companies or firms or studios and they, those studios would take care of them their entire life. Now it's all contractors for the most part. So the studios are going to do what they have always done, which is they're going to continue to try to maximize profit. And so there's no question that that's going to impact that, that environment, right? There's no question. It's already happening. It, it, we're not going to see the full brunt of it for a while, but that's already happening. Um, I do think that, look, I was already, <laughs> I already thought that the, the, all the work on ArtStation was low quality and it looked the same and it was so cookie cutter and it, people were just doing these same techniques. I thought that that art had been getting devalued for a long time before the AI thing. So if you devalue what you do because it's not meaningful, it doesn't take a lot of craft, it's just techniques and tools and an over-reliance on copying the look. So if you make your art less valuable, it's going to be more replaceable. So I'm not blaming the artists for this, but this is something that you could see coming, dude. You could see this coming for a long time. They're looking for, I mean, look, if they, if a video game, if a AAA video game company could just scan cheaply a bunch of characters and do a bunch of automated techniques and auto rigging IK and everything, they will do that. So have no doubt about it. There, all, there is, that also creates a space for more artistic things. Like look at, uh, uh, one of our instructors, Ilya Morochnik, is a lead character artist at, a, a, I don't know, Zaum, Z-A-U-M. And they did, a, they did Disco Elysium. There are kind of like boutique companies and studios that specialize in doing like stuff that is more creative and artistic. And I think that the, I think those, there, there's room for like boutique studios to do that. I think though that 
the I think it's probably not great news for a lot of if you're a prop designer or a concept artist or certain kinds of illustrators or I think those people are uh, I think things are changing the most there first but at the same time if you're doing commissions let's say people have I mean literally our art model who was modeling for us for this project she showed us all of these images of her own face that was generated by AI and all these different artistic styles and so she was asking me if this there was one in the style of Alphonse Mucha and she was like that's as good as Mucha right and I'm like that's not as good as Mucha that's that's garbage compared to Mucha she can't tell the difference that's scary because if the lay people can't tell the difference between an Alphonse Mucha and a stupid generated thing then that is bad for opportunity so the problem is there's the AI is good enough already to trick lay people. And so I think what is going to, I think the plus side of this conversation is that, um, look, there's a supply and demand element. If the art is worthless and you can generate it on your phone and it all looks the same and it has a certain style, then something made with human hands and a human mind that is different from that is gonna have value. It's just like you know, uh, cheap manufacturing of stuff ever since the Bauhaus and the Industrial Revolution and, you know, the removal of decoration from works and everything's a cube and everything's mass produced and there's these political, uh, what, but that creates an, an, uh, an opportunity for Etsy where people are hand building tables, you know, like I'm sitting on a table right now, this was built in India and it's a fantastic craftsmanship, you know. I will always prefer to buy something that is human made and has uh, meaning and care and attention than something from Target or whatever. And so I think that I think that it, it's possible that this has a positive effect where um, there's so much temptation. Because look, it's so difficult to learn art. It takes you a decade to get anywhere. It's so difficult to learn art and it's already so rare that somebody becomes masterful in, in the fundamentals. That's already so rare now that I think in the future, it's gonna become even more elite. And people who are really masters at traditional crafts are going to be able to command a higher price point because people that have money, they're, they don't want this auto-generated crap anymore. You know, They want something different. And so I think it actually can create opportunities that if you invest in your fundamentals now, if you invest in becoming something that is different than your work does not look like ArtStation. If you invest in that now, I think that you have the, I think you're actually investing in your future. Because look, if you're a highly skilled artist with good fundamentals, you can get into animation or concept design or storyboarding or illustration or portraits or, you can do so many stuff. If you're locked into one technique, like, oh, I learned how to do figure from this one YouTube thing and I'm doing these techniques based on this and your work looks exactly the same, as everybody else, you're not in a good position. So I think now is the best time to invest in the, the stuff that is the opposite of that, which is the human craft side of it. Focus on that, especially, if, dude, if a bunch of people get scared about AI and they drop out of art school and they quit, sad, but also huge opportunity for you. So this is the time where we double down on craft. This is the time where we double down on the human element because that's gonna become a premium, I, I think. But maybe not within the realm of concept art, let's say. Although there are still human elements to that. Oh, we cut out a bit. Is the internet Joshua, working? You're... Wait for just a bit. Am I back? You're back. Okay, you're back. sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, do, do, do you want to do one more question and then maybe we can do the announcement or what? Uh, yeah, sure. We can do one more question if you want. Uh, let me just check. Um, I want to try and get a good one. Do we maybe have a question in the audience? <laughs> I don't know. Most people I have around. one about social media. Yeah, if true. you want a social media question. Sure. Yeah. I love it. All right, so how do you I love it. Our audience. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk social media. Let's do it. How did you find your audience in social media? What do people look for in your drawings and works? Uh, when I first started, because yeah, I, I had done social media yeah. campaigns for uh, clients and for uh, other other businesses and stuff. So at the time when I was starting, I was literally just sharing my my journey. So I had a I had a thread on concept art where I was like, hey, I'm learning art and I'm just sharing my drawings as I go. That's sort of how my uh, at the time it was Facebook, that's how that, uh, that's how I did that. It was just sharing my process. 
and just seeing seeing how frequently I'm posting and how much the work is improving and how ambitious it was, I thought that that would be a good narrative that people would like and they would like start rooting for me and following. And that, that was sort of the strategy at first. Uh, when New Masters Academy started though, I started, I sort of stopped posting to my, uh, my Joshua page and I started pushing everybody to New Masters. And then New Masters kept me so busy for like, you know, years that I kind of neglected my social media. So I actually got back on, like I, I, I got active on Instagram pretty late uh, and I got, uh, you know, involved in, in that stuff for myself as an artist a little bit later and everything had just changed. So it was completely different. So when I was starting, you know, uh, you could reach your followers. So if you had a lot of followers, they would see your posts. But now the way that it is, is basically how many followers you have is very disconnected to your actual engagement. So unfortunately now you need to comp every one of your posts and it needs to be video, that sucks. You know, it needs to be reels probably. But all of your posts you need to it needs to compete for people's attention within that first fraction of a second. And if it doesn't, it just never gets a chance. So if you're not super active and you're not on top of it and you're not focusing on it, your engagement can just plummet. You know, I, I, you spend a few weeks not posting and your engagement's like absolutely in the toilet, like less than 1%. So there's also elements like whether it thinks what you're doing is nudity. So like you have to be aware of that, that they might not take your post down, but they can throttle it and things like that. So I, I think that uh, it's unfortunate because the world really does look at your social to figure out what your status is and whether you're somebody worth paying attention to. Uh, that's a reality. I know gallery owners of popular galleries who are literally using Instagram to find to find talent. And uh, you know, this is the same thing in like acting, you know, they'll 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 look at how many followers an actor has before offering them a role. So it, unfortunately, it's becoming very much a, it's become a a real measurable capital uh, in terms of status even though they're not really your followers. They're you're working for you're basically working for Meta. You're making content for their platform. You have no control over it. They can change it all the time. They can block you or ban you or do whatever they want. You can't do anything about it. So I think the problem with social media is that if you get successful at it, you're constantly afraid that the algorithm is going to change and all of a sudden your YouTube videos aren't going to get views or your Instagram isn't going to get views. So if you build your career on social media, I think you're in a very vulnerable position and it's very stressful. And the people I know who are, who have that situation are terrified. They're always stressed out. Um, if you can build a business where you have a direct access to your audience, whether that is collectors or fans or whatever, that's more valuable. So my, generally my advice for social media is email list, email list, email list, email list. You need to get direct contact and you need to develop, if you have 200 people on your email list and, and you're actually, they actually follow you or you have a Discord uh, server or something where you have more direct personal contact with them, there's no algorithm. If you have that, that's more valuable. I would rather have 200 people that read my emails than 200,000 people who may or may not see my stuff. So I think social media needs to be prioritized and I think it's a lower priority than building actual direct connection with your audience, something like an email. Email is the gold standard, it has been for 40 years. So I think that, but it, it's a time trade-off. You need to find out how do, you, how do you present yourself at the level you need to for your business opportunities, like what range of views or numbers you need to get into in order to, to, to use it effectively, but I think you need to, you need to figure out how much time you're willing to spend on the social media. I would much rather see people investing in that direct relationship, like an email relationship, for example. So I think that as long as you realize that it is not the ticket to success, although for some people it has been, that you need to make it subordinate to your overall strategy. You need to focus on actual creation of quality work and not focus on doing videos. And also don't do fake videos, dude. Because I don't know if it's just me, but when I see an artist tracing or performing a, performing a painting that they've already worked out or they're tracing it or something, which I see everywhere, um, I, they lose credibility. So I think that if you are tempted to do kind of fake drawing demos, which is becoming very popular, I think you might be undermining your, your long-term credibility. So try to keep it honest, keep it real, contextualize the amount of time you're spending on social and, and focus more on getting, get a MailChimp account, there's free tiers, figure out a way to build an email list, make a simple website, and then 
get find a way to get people onto your email list so they can build a direct connection with you. Focus on that, and then social media needs to be secondary to that. You know, and, that, and that's that's my businesses as well, and that's what's that's what's worked for me. I mean, there's there's other there's other online learning platforms where they started on YouTube or they started on some other platform, and then they funneled it to their business. But that is that continues to be how their business runs. So New Masters Academy, for example, it's not like that at all. Like we don't do much on social at all. You know, although we do have, you know, we have some of the most popular videos on YouTube and stuff, but the amount of energy that goes towards social at New Masters is like less than 1% of what we're doing here. And I feel like we're in a stronger position, and definitely financially and other aspects of it are, are much stronger than competitors. And I think that's because we built the business the right way, which is not relying on another company to be in charge of it. It's like the mafia. It's like, oh wait, you have followers, but you can't reach them anymore unless you boost your posts or this or that. It's like, you don't wanna get into that kind of situation with, with another company, especially when they're constantly like, Instagram is trying to become TikTok and TikTok is could be becoming banned in a lot of places. Like this is way too volatile and way too risky for your career. It's not safe for you. So try to find a way to use it in a way that is subordinate to a primary strategy, which involves real human connections. Ideally, connections that involve face-to-face -face if possible. Also, people's numbers are fake too. So like there's so many AI powered bots that, and also people are trying to get out of, dude, I tried to hire two consult, uh, marketing people uh, to, per, to, to a cross promotion thing. Both of them said they were trying to get out of the business. And I just had somebody contact me. It's one of the biggest pages for sculptures. So they've got tons of views. It's like one of those sculpture gallery pages and they're trying to sell it to me. So like people are trying to get out of this too. It's, it's very volatile. So don't, don't invest all of your time in social. Try to build something that's more substantial and something that will weather, will weather these changes better. You know? That being said, there's obviously a lot of strategy on social that we don't have time to get into. And it is valuable, obviously. But it just can't be your primary. It shouldn't be your primary. OK. Uh, you hear, heard it here first. A small business one-on-one with Joshua. <laughs> <laughs> OK, yeah. So this was the last question, and with this we're gonna wrap it up with a yeah. rumor that I heard. Yeah. <laughs> so I heard you know more about it. Yeah. So I, I think <laughs> most of you here, or maybe you don't know this, but for the last two years we've been in a beta for our track program. So New Masters Academy, uh, it, it can work as a library where you pay to get access to it, and you can take any of the classes. You don't have to check them out like a library. You can just watch it all. If you've got the right plan, you can access all the references. You can just jump around and do new masters, just like Netflix. Like, what do I want to do today? Um, and it's been like that for, for 10 years. Uh, we've been working for many years towards something that is much more like art school, where it's tracks, where it's literally four-year degrees, essentially. I mean, we're not accredited currently, but it's the equivalent of what you would get if you went to Ringling or Art Center or an Atelier or New York Academy of Art or whatever, right? It's that equivalent education actually much more content than those than those resources have much more so we have been structuring things together we call it the course guide it's a pdf on the site you can download and it basically is all broken down for you and we spent years developing this and uh, a lot of the top new masters academy instructors people like glenn vilpu and bill perkins and they have been helping us to organize this stuff for for many years so that's been in beta which means that on the discord server or on the website you can go through these interactive tracks and you actually get feedback so you actually get critiques and feedback for no extra charge every plan offers this but it's only been sort of uh on discord and it's been sort of a smaller controlled group but we over the next few years are going to be expanding this significantly so uh this week we're going to be unlocking part three and part four, I believe, of the Drawing Foundations course. So nobody has actually gotten to the finishing line yet in the beta because it takes time to go through all the courses and get all the feedback, but we're opening up more runway. And over the next four years, we are going to be unlocking everything else in the course guide as interactives where you can get feedback. And we're gonna be unlocking those as students uh, hit the limit of what's available. So we're, this is something we've been waiting for for a long time. Um, what that means essentially is that if you're not doing the interactive courses at New Masters, you're not using New Masters Academy the best way. If you're just watching courses, your results from what we've seen in addition to group coaching and everything, the results that you'll get from New Masters by just watching the courses you want are vastly inferior to the results if you do it properly in order 
earn their certificates, get the feedback, unlocks the next step, go through everything. That is the best way to learn. That is, that's your hack for getting Art Center for you know, one one hundredth of the price. That's your, that's your ticket. So in order to encourage people to start doing this and to sort of announce it and to celebrate 10 years, we actually came up with a, an offer, which is hard because we just had the, the biggest, the biggest, we do two really big sales a year. So we had to have an offer that was different than that, that it was compelling, but we're doing basically an art school offer. So it's called the NMA's complete art, art education plan. Uh, there's a link that's nma.art slash complete that you can check out. It's a four year plan. Um, and the intention here is that uh, you're basic. Look, there's a lot of people who are younger too and their parents want them to go to art school. That's like a deal, they'll pay for it. But this is a good thing to go to your uncle or your grandparents or your parents over because this is being structured as a non-degree certificate, um, but an art school plan. And you will have that track ahead of you to do it interactively all the way through. That's what we've been preparing for. So it's a four-year plan that you're getting at a, a huge discount. It's actually a four-year commitment, I believe. And the details are gonna be talked about today at 3 p.m. But we want people to think of this as, this is your art school. So if you're thinking of maybe going to art school, you could do this instead of art school. I think you'll get better results. If you're going to a really good art school, you could get this in addition to it, and this could be a supplement. Art Center, Ringling, these are group coaching uh, subscribers for New Masters Academy. So the best art schools in the world partner with New Masters Academy, Disney Animation Studios, so Sony Santa Monica, Blizzard. There's all of these uh, companies over the years who have used New Masters Academy to train their, their professional artists at well. So New Masters Academy is not just beginner friendly, it is art school, it's a competitor or supplement to art school, and it's a training tool used by the top companies in the world. And so now, you're, you can actually do this. This is a four-year investment where you can become part of New Masters and you can get your art, the equivalent of your art school experience here uh, at New Masters at, at a big discount. Three o'clock p.m. today, uh, Caleb is gonna be talking about it. They're also gonna be, Marion's gonna be talking too. There's some big improvements to the coaching program that's happening as well. So you can check out those details. There's gonna be more details about the offer and everything there. Um, so New Masters is moving hard in, uh, more into the structure realm and we're moving into accreditation. This is, New Masters is gonna become more and more like, an, like a, you know, a top art school in the future. This is, this is a big step forward in that, in that thing. So uh, the beta opened up. Uh, now we're sort of asking people to start doing it now because you're not gonna, I mean, hopefully this is not gonna be the case, but you're not gonna hit a wall. You should be able to start doing the interactives now and you'll be able to go through all four years, which is the estimated time it takes you to get through these different modules. So that's the offer, it's really exciting. There's gonna be details uh, later later today about that. Even if you don't do that offer, oh yeah, and there also is gonna be, if you just did the sale and bought a year, you're, you can roll whatever your plan is into this. So if you want to commit, it's also, it's nice, you know, the hard thing about New Masters being so affordable is that people can kind of come and go. They're not nailed down like if they went to art school. If you do this, it's also a good incentive for you to actually get the most out of it and take it seriously and treat it like an art school. And I think that that's really the best way to get the best benefit. And this is an offer that we're doing in celebration of that. But even if this is not something you can swing, any subscription plan, you could be going about it this way. But I, I wanna sort of recommend every student that's listening to this, if you're not doing the interactives, stop what you're doing, do the interactives, start at the beginning. You're gonna, that is the best value in art education. It, it's, it's, uh, that's gonna put you in the best position to achieve whatever your goals are. There are tracks for sculpture, there's tracks for entertainment, there's tracks for comics, there's tracks for illustration, there's tracks for portrait art, there's tracks for figure painting, there's carving wood carving, marble carving, like this is really an online affordable art school. Um, a lot of people don't even know about the interactive stuff at all. So, but this is definitely, I think the best way that you can set yourself up for success and pay the least and be able to work remotely. In addition to workshops, in addition to life drawing classes or urban sketchers or your own independent study, but uh, that's what we're doing here. So I'm really excited about this. Uh, I know the team worked really hard to put this together. It's gonna be available obviously for a limited, it's the 10 year anniversary. We have to do something huge. So we had, we had, we had to do something. So um, definitely check that out. There'll be more details. Um, give us feedback, let us know. If you've got questions about this, don't be shy, just ask. But we've tried to make this incredibly easy for anybody to, to take advantage of this opportunity if, if, they're, if they're interested in doing so. 
Okay, thank you, Joshua. Thank you for your time. And with that, we'll say goodbye. I all while we wait for yeah. the three p.m. Q and A with sure. Caleb and uh, Marion. Yeah. That they will talk more about this. Uh, there, there will be going on a master study Tuesday. So Ooh. everybody, welcome to our Discord. Join us in the events section. We'll be doing master studies. We'll be drawing together. Awesome. So we'll have a lot of fun while we wait for uh, this great Q and A that's uh, coming yeah. on. And, and so, yeah. Yeah. Anybody, anybody listening thank to you this? For joining us today. Yeah. I just want to say real quick, Wiggly, if you're listening to the, I don't know if this is going to be on YouTube or whatever. If you're listening to this and you're not in the New Masters Academy community, you're fucking up. This is literally the best community for artists anywhere. You don't have to be a subscriber. It's free. It's supportive. It's exciting. There's all this stuff going on. There's all these activities and events. You need to like look at yourself in the mirror, ask yourself what you're doing with your life. Get on the New Masters Academy Discord right now. This is not a sales funnel. It is literally like a vibrant online community full of people who actually know what they're talking about. And they're not gonna, you're not gonna get bullied. You're not gonna, you're not gonna get spammed here. It's not a place to, you know, it is, it, it's really like, like it's the only social media that I actually like is the, is the New Masters Academy Discord. So I'm, I'm reading everything, following everybody's work. It's such an inspiring, collaborative, good vibes thing with really solid, fundamentals and leadership in, in, in place. And I, I think it is the coolest thing on the internet for artists. So that is absolutely free. If you're, if you are not part of that, you need to get part of it. You need to become part of it. Other sites are trying to like re replicate what we're doing here and they're failing and it's hilarious. This is magic in a bottle. You definitely need to like check this out if you're not part of it already. And you know, I'm on there as well. And you know, it's just, not, it's a nice like, you know, going back to ancient Greece, it's like a nice forum for conversation to happen about the arts and for people to support each other and people to get the answers. If you're feeling confused, like you don't know how to reach your goals, we ha there are answers and you can, you can find them here and you can find that support and that motivation and you can make friends and people from the New Masters community are meeting up all over the world. And it's probably gonna continue to build into this thing and it's gonna keep spilling out into the real world and it's, it's just it's just really exciting and and because it's no commitment i think everyone should check it out yeah everybody welcome and thank you again everybody for joining and thank happy you. 10 the greater years good. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank you so much alex and for, to 10 uh, for or 20 this. 30 more <laughs> <laughs> all right yeah, thank you joshua yeah. thank you for your time and answering our questions fantastic thanks okay. everybody have fun everybody